Okay, uh, next is uh, another topic on security, and it's an uh, update on Secure uh, Luster by James Bill and uh, Pavlas um, Antonio and from uh, Welcome Sanger Institute. James has been a system administrator for over 30 years and has been a member of the uh, informatics support group at Welcome Sanger Institute for more than 13 years. He has been supporting uh, Luster during that time and OpenStack for the last five years. Uh, Pavlas is the principal software developer uh, informatization for the human genetic informatics group. Uh, he works closely with the faculty of human genetics to develop informatics solutions to analyze and realize uh, uh, gen gen genomic data from popula population studies utilizing current technologies. Uh, welcome. Uh, Please go ahead. Thank you. First, we're going to first we're going to introduce the Welcome Science Institute and the work we've been do we've done over the last twenty eight years and the impact we've had on COVID nineteen in the last year. Secondly, I'll talk about how we've implemented Secure Luster using commodity layer three switches and some of the choices we've made and the repercussions on security and data access. Pavlos will then talk about the, how the ability to access data from inside OpenStack has enabled research which was previously inaccessible. Then we'll recap and answer questions. The Sanger Institute is one of the world's leading sequencing facilities. When the first draft of the human genome was announced in the year 2000, the center was the single largest contributor. From sequencing around a third of the human genome in the years prior to the year 2000, and the work which took over four years, which led to the release of the first gold standard human genome in 2004. In 2020, we sequenced the equivalent of one gold standard human genome every five minutes and 12 seconds. The Institute is a family member of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. Because Consortium's work identified B117 and showed that it is more transmissible, which led to changes in the UK government policy and has alerted the world to the threat of this variant. And today, we are charting the rise of B16172. More than 20 million samples have been handled by the Institute, and we've sequenced just under 300,000 samples. As of April 2021, we have the capacity to sequence 20,000 virus samples a week, with the intention that this will be raised to 50,000 samples a week soon. The Institute has a capability to process large amounts of information using on-premise equipment. We use a combination of traditional HPC and OpenStack, depending on the problem being addressed. The requirements for data isolation are increasing over time, and different projects require different amounts of isolation. Sequencing the Red Squirrel genome has a different requirement from sequencing the cancer genome and the patient's normal genome. And this is true of the downstream analysis. Data security is a difficult task with traditional compute. This is only made harder by the fact that OpenStack users have root access on virtual machines. Today, our traditional compute areas are protected from OpenStack by a complex ACL that stops unauthenticated traffic from leaving the public network and accessing arbitrary systems on the traditional network. We have a policy that before a host port pair is added to the standard ACL, then we inspect the service and only authenticated protocols are allowed. This, for example, disallows NFS, but allows SIFs. Standard access is routed via an access system, which renders lusters unusable. This talk is an update to one given in 2017 at ISC. We've also updated the associated white paper. Paper is yet to be published up there. If people need it, they can send me an email or you'll be there in a day or two. OpenStack provides a method for creating, managing, and using virtual machines programmatically. OpenStack also provides a web interface. These allow our developers the freedom to build solutions to the problems our researchers have. We have two production OpenStack instances. The first, our dedicated production sequencing cluster, which was purchased to complete our por portion of the UK biobank sequencing. This cluster has been used for COVID-19 work over the last year. It consists of 3,500 cores of compute with 36 terabytes of RAM and 70 terabytes of Ceph for block and image storage. The primary storage is provided by a redundant pair of three petabyte luster systems. Our main OpenStack instance has 10,000 cores and 115 terabytes of RAM which is used for research and for faculty sequencing work. We have five petabytes of usable self presented both as block and as a S3 compatible system. Faculty sequencing supported by a single three petabyte 
plus the system. This system was upgraded last year and access since then has been via Secure Luster. This file system is also supporting access from traditional box compute. The configuration of networks and subnets for each project is independent of the configuration of the secure luster systems. A relatively simple ACL is applied to the router, which is implemented on the top of each of our top of rack switches that all hypervisors are connected to. On each secure luster system, a node map entry is created, which defines the share for each project. Access to the network, and therefore the share, is granted by an RMAC entry in OpenStack. The users can then create a machine instance with two network interfaces, and then the file system will be mounted automatically. We provide example scripts to show how this is done. We create the images using the Packer via a continuous integration pipeline. A Luster system can support up to 32 LNET spaces. However, Exascaler, DDN's package Luster, limits this further to 17 LNET spaces. These are independent next network spaces. We use the idea with Ethernet and have assigned each division in the Institute to a separate LNET space with the idea that a misconfiguration in the network would at worst lead data to local to that division. I'm not sure I'd recommend this extra step, but may suggest using a single outlet space per OpenStack instance. A separate outlet space is allocated to traditional compute, which greatly simplifies access. If you have wish to have multiple shares from a single file system to a single Luster client, then each share must be on a different outlet. Subnet mount changed the root directory for a client. Identity mapping changes the canonical ID the file system uses when presented with an ID from the client. Each project that requires access to the file system requires a separate node map entry. There's an extreme use case where every user of the system has their own OpenStack project and a separate provider network, a node map providing them with access to the whole file system. Identity mapping is well documented in the Luster Operations Manual, so a quick recap. The settings we generally use squash all users to a single user, but provide that client with the canonical IDs. This means that if the client was bound to LDAP or local users created with the same UIDs, then file permissions would look correct. Again, all access reads writes from the secure Luster client is done as the maps user. As with OpenStack, all members of the OpenStack project have equivalent access to the data inside OpenStack. This means that any member of the OpenStack project can read, write, or delete any data contained in the OpenStack project. Secure Luster extends that equivalence to the data shared with the project from Luster. The first decision to be made is should the whole file system be shared with traditional HPC? By sharing the subdirectory, we'd allow the possibility of shares which are private to OpenStack. Sanger currently shares the whole file system with HPC. Some divisions have local informatics groups specific to the division. Each of the groups in that division have a directory under a divisional directory. By creating a share and mapping the informatics groups and pipeline users, the divisional informatics groups can maintain the data more easily. Users have root privilege inside OpenStack virtual machines. If a directory is owned by a mapped user or group, then the virtual machine has full control over the contents of the directory to the extent that any files created will be owned by the mapped user or group. Just to reiterate, we have multiple tenants using a single LNET space. Shares can have multiple UIDs and GIDs mapped into a single share. However, this is convenient, and at that point, you can't tell what user or group has made any access request as root is available inside the virtual machine. The Sanger network, Sanger Scientific Network uses Arista switches with standard compute nodes linked with dual 25 gigabit links, network and nodes linked with dual 100 gigabit links. Switch pairs are connected northbound with four by 100 gig links. VXLAN is used to stretch VLANs between switch pairs and disparate parts of the network. Today, OSPF is used as the interior gateway protocol with BGP as the exterior gateway protocol. VLANs can be routed on many physically distinct switches using virtual ARP. We promote layer two MAC address entries to host routes to ensure that return traffic is routed to the correct switch before being forwarded to the directly connected host. Conceptually, a secure Luster OpenStack client has at least two interfaces. The first is the self-service network, which is used for all standard access. This interface's traffic must pass through in that stage on the project router. This means that Luster access is not possible via this route. The second additional net interfaces are dedicated to Luster storage traffic. Each of these elements are transported between the top of the rack switches to the Luster servers on separate VLANs. All the Luster services and all the OpenStack instances are conceptually connected with the top of with the Luster top of rack switch pair, providing isolation using a single ACL. 
In this slightly more realistic diagram, we show that the Luster storage router is implemented on the top of rack switches that the hypervisors are connected to. These switch pairs are responsible for ensuring that only packets to the correct outlet space on the secure Luster system are allowed to first the router and enter the general network. We have a number of racks in our OpenStack instance, and these top of rack switches, and all these top of rack switches, an ACL is implemented as a distributed router. As there are a large number of switches, and we need to ensure that we're applying packets routed to the correct switch where a guest is connected, this is achieved by a switch pair injecting a host route for any directly attached hosts, meaning the correct switch pair can be chosen by the upstream routers. If the, if the network infrastructure is trusted, then no ACL is required on the Luster top of rack switches, so we can trust the packet source to be correct. In practice, we have an ACL which limits access to known HPC subnets on TCP0 and access to management interfaces to admin systems. If the network between OpenStack and the Luster servers is not trusted, then some form of connect secure connection is required, for example, MacSec over VXLAN. Switches that support this are a significant expense. Client IP addresses are allocated to OpenStack projects and could be used to connect to any number of distinct Luster file systems. By allocating a division, a division to an outlet space and allocating the network sequentially, it's possible to have a single ACL entry per outlet space per file system. This is important for the TCAM, which is hardware resource on the ASIC using the switches at the top of each rack, is a limited resource. When investigating performance numbers, and trying to explain the performance of different systems, it became clear that I needed to introduce OBS. Linux bridges are relatively simple software abstractions that move packets from one interface to another. OBS is a fairly complex software switch that supports, in particular, NetFlows and VXLAN. It's important to note that a secure Luster package traverses two Linux bridges to OBS before arriving at the bonding driver. This introduces latency and reduces the maximum of packets that can be switched per second. When we look at the performance of virtual machines compared to physical machines, I believe that the differences can be attributed to this additional packet switching that is done in software. Machines that use Luster are more complex than standard machines. We do not expect our users to be expert systems administrators. We provide images that our users can modify. This image examines the environment it's running in and mounts any available Luster file shares. As a Luster machine needs two different network devices with different security settings, then the web interface can't be used to create these machines in a single step. We provide example bash scripts and Terraform configuration, and our workflow runner, WR, also has support for creating instances on OpenStack that mount a Luster file system. We have, for example, used our images and Terraform to create a Kubernetes cluster which provisions storage from the Luster share. Each Luster provider network is created in advance. In this example, the network is created with a VLAN identifier 75 and an MTU of 9000, with port security disabled. A subnet is created with a DHCP range and a route injected for each Luster system that has a share available. Access to the network is granted by adding an R back entry for the project. If two projects wanted access to the same file set with a different user mapping, this would be a new node map. If two projects wanted access to the same file set with the same user mapping, then you create a new network and add the new network as a range to the existing node map. Creating shares is prone to error. By creating shares consistently with a script, these errors are reduced. Once the node map is created, we need to wait until the configuration is stable on all Luster clients before continuing the configuration. We ask that there's no activity on the node map when we make changes, as the behavior is undefined, and machines and node operators can easily get confused. This very simple script was used to compare the performance of a number of systems. We did try and use FIO, however, the configuration did not provide us with consistent results. Here we see LUST23, our latest research file system. 5.3 petabytes of usable storage, 8 by 100 gigabit link uplinks to our core network, and a nominal 60 gigabytes per second file system performance. Luster 24 will have the external DELs replaced by SFA 400 MV or 24 MVMEs supporting data on metadata. We can see that with our simple test, the that performance is mostly unaffected by the size of the instance. This likely shows that the hypervisor has no noisy neighbors. M2 instances do not have overcommitted CPU, no instance has overcommitted RAM. Running a pair of instances on a co located machine showed an increase in performance, however, it is unclear whether this is just due to having two streams of work. 
Here we compare a whole hypervisor VM using secure luster with a, with a physical node accessing the file system in a traditional manner. The virtual machine appears to hit a single stream performance limit. I believe this is due to the overhead imposed by OVS. Performance of the virtual machines is more than sufficient to enable it to be used for production workloads. To eliminate the overhead of virtualization, we decided to take a single HPC compute node and compare performance when configured to either traditional compute or when configured to use secure luster. We can see that the access is by secure luster does not affect the performance achieved at the client. The target file system is in normal use, and I believe that any dif dif differences in performance can be attributed to this. And now I'll hand over to Pavos. Thank you, James. Thank you. So um, um, I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, the recent implementation of the Secure Luster for our human genetics projects um, and how this support um, came to help us into our, the analysis of our data using the OpenStack cloud-based projects that we have. And the human genetics uh, department at Sanger has um, lots, lots of um, projects that have large cohorts of data, either data that we sequence locally in our sequencer and sequencing facilities, or data that we um, import from out, outside sources. We have large cohorts of whole genome and exome sequencing data. And also we combine these local cohorts with um, external frequencies from large uh, research programs like UK Bank and NOMAD. Um, an example of analysis that we do with these large cohorts is that we do data QC, quality check of the data. We then run statistical analysis, GWAS, and we do some uh, phenotype association analysis with them. The main goal of all of these research programs is to identify new genes and variants that are likely causing the disease um, from this association analysis. Um, I'm going to talk to you specifically uh, about two projects that I worked uh, with uh, recently um, at the human genetics department that have to do with um, uh, the secure luster support. The first one is called Interval. This is a whole genome sequencing project. It has uh, 12,000, more than 12,000 samples that have been uh, sequenced. Um, there were 24 joint call VCF files with the variants of these uh, samples. And the task that was uh, given to us was to run the quality checking pipeline for each chromosome of this large cohort, save the results after the variant and sample QC, combine all the individual chromosome files into one large whole genome-wide uh, matrix table, and then run the GWAS analysis for this whole genome sequencing file to produce association analysis files and plots for each phenotype. The second project is called MegaWES. So this is um, a combination of uh, exome sequencing samples, 93,600 of them, uh, that came from different sequencing uh, platforms. So we combine all of these um, samples together in one project, and we, um, we followed the um, established NOMAD uh, QC analysis for sample and variant QC. And our aim is to clean the data set, remove the samples that fail the sample QC, remove the variants that fail the variant QC, and have a, a good quality data set to run association analysis. For the, um, the last couple of years, uh, the human genetics department has moved to HALE for its, for its large high throughput analysis of genomic data sets. Traditionally, using an HPC, um, we've been using uh, the uh, high throughput um, HPC analysis using um, parallel execution of algorithms, splitting uh, the giant BCF into multiple smaller parts, parallelly uh, running each, each shard and getting the results for each individual shard and then combining them all together at the end to produce a final result. Um, with HAIL, which is a, a software tool developed at the Broad Institute, this is no longer necessary to split all the VCF files into small shards. Um, HAIL is a scalable software for genomic analysis 
it can run on a cluster, on the cloud, even on the laptop. It's based on Python. It's a Python library uh, exposed uh, with a Spark backend. It allows one to write code in Jupyter Notebook or run Python scripts. And it's, it's, uh, it allows distributed computing of the data sets using the matrix table data structure. The matrix table data structure that I show in this slide is a representation of the multi-sample VCF with just one data structure, the matrix table. In the matrix table, you have the columns that represent the samples in the VCF. The, the, ro the rows represent the variants that are present in the VCF. And the entries are the specific genotype information of each sample per variant. So it's one data structure, and the way it's saved into memory allows distributed computing. So this is why HAL is so powerful and is used uh, so much for genomic analysis. And HAL allows statistical analysis of thousands of VCF samples in the same time. And we've been using HAL uh, with uh, OpenStack Spark clusters um, that we uh, bring up locally uh, in, the, in Sanger. And the only thing we need to do is install Python and HAL on it. Um, so as I said, HAIL is very powerful for data for genomic analysis because it allows one to read and write in the common formats that we're used to, VCF files, JSON, link for, uh, for linkage, and so on, and bed files. It allows us to filter, group, and aggregate the data to, uh, to be able to do analysis. It also allows us to annotate the variants from web or Nirvana and able to analyze the consequences of each variant. And uh, also allows us to quickly visualize the data and to be able to uh, get some input on, uh, on how the data is distributed. Um, most importantly, AHEL has built-in function, functions for statistical analysis and one of the main um, pro uh, projects that we do in the human genetics since 1G was statistical linear regression to find associations uh, for the phenotypes of, of, each, uh, of each variant. So this is included in HEL. So this is why the department has moved to HEL in the last two years. Um, so two years ago, when we first started using HEL, this was the initial HEL setting that we had. So as I said, we run HAIL on, in, in an OpenStack uh, cluster. Uh, we bring up the cluster from, I bring up the cluster from my laptop. I define my master node and I uh, define a number of workers uh, to uh, bring up for the cluster. And I attach um, a, a persistent volume, an FS volume to the cluster um, to be able to save the data and copy the data that I'm going to use on. Usually, uh, because I, I work with large cohorts, I have a very large um, NFS uh, volume of 50 terabytes that I use to save all my results. Additionally, we have more recently, we had HDFS support added to our clusters. Now, all the data sets in, all the data sets in, in the Sanger Institute, most of them from all the research groups uh, are lie at the farm. So the farm the lab has all the data on the laster. And for me to be able to use that data set in the initial hill setting, I had to copy the data, data from, from the farm to my OpenStack cluster. So that meant using an intermediary like S3. I was using uh, our clone to copy the data from the farm to S3 and from S3 to the NFS volume. Uh, to be able to use it. Subsequently, to share the data of my results with the rest of the, of the human genetics groups, I had to copy it back to farm, which adds an additional overhead of time and copying. Uh, you can also use directly SCP between the two, but uh, I've noticed that that wasn't very reliable and I had to restart my copying many times to be able to copy the data sets. Now, with the secure luster configuration that was uh, available to us recently from the work that ISG has done for us, um, we are able now to access directly the farm from our OpenStack clusters. We can read and write from the farm, and we can create virtual machines in OpenStack that uh, can read and write to the high-performance POSIX file system. And this is a 
very big breakthrough because as I said, all of our data is on in the uh, Luster system and it's been there for over 13 years. There are 30 petabytes of data there um, uh, available for research analysis. So, so, the, so the ability to quickly access that and write and read directly is, is really helping us. Um, there are different tenants and users in OpenStack so that allow security of the data. And similarly, there are different teams and groups in Luster that provide security of the data depending on the group that wants to access it. Um, now, I, I want to go through uh, the specific two projects that I mentioned before and how the, um, the analysis for this project was improved and benefited from the introduction of Secure Luster. The first testing script I used with Secure Luster was part of the interval whole genome sequencing project that I mentioned. Um, at this project, I was tasked to do the sample environment QC pipeline for, for the chromosome one. This step was failing to complete with your initial health configuration I described before using the NFS volume attached to it. Um, we couldn't make this to work and because we were pressed for time for results, we ended up migrating the pipeline to Google Cloud. In Google Cloud, we were able to complete this step in, uh, in two hours and we were able to save the results into the Google storage. And then we had to download the results to the farm. Um, later on, uh, ISG provided HDFS support in our open cell clusters. So we were able to successfully run this step and uh, we were able to write to HDFS the result of this pipeline in about three hours. As I mentioned before, in both these steps, there was a data transfer overhead. Copying the results from my health volume to the farm to share with the team the results, it was very time consuming. As an example, the whole genome sequencing matrix table, which is a five terabyte file, it takes more than 24 hours to copy from the volume to the farm. Um, and as I said, the fastest and most reliable way I found was to copy using S3. Copy first to S3 and then copy back to, uh, to the farm from uh, S3. The second script, that I used with Secure Luster was part of the Mega West project that I mentioned before. I was tasked here to write out the final hail matrix table to disk after performing random forest classification. And then from this matrix table, export that table to a VCF file that I will share with the team. So there were two steps, export to matrix table and, and save to disk and export to VCF. Um, with an OpenStack cluster with uh, 50 workers, the step of writing out the matrix table was consistently failing, even with HDFS, with a lot of memory issues. That would require quite a larger, maybe a cluster to be able to complete. The exporting to VCF was possible We're using the, the HDFS volume uh, cluster um, in a parallel mode. But this was only possible without saving the final matrix table, which means that every time I wanted to uh, access, recreate VCF, I had to run all the uh, steps of the pipeline to recreate the matrix table again, which is also um, uh, time consuming to create it again. Um, and again, as I mentioned, there was, there's always the additional time to copy the data to farm for the team to access. So these two scripts is the, uh, the ones I use uh, to test the new secure Luster implementation. And this table here shows the results of this test with secure Luster. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna quickly go through it uh, with you. Um, so um, on the first row, I have the cluster properties for each individual test. Um, so if you look at the, the second row, it has the first project, which was the QC for the chromosome one uh, whole genome sequencing in terrible project. As I mentioned, this step failed with the uh, 50 worker um, cluster with the 50 terabyte volume. It was uh, with the uh, um, persistent NFS volume, this was failing. So we moved to uh, uh, this, this step completed uh, when we moved to uh, HDF, when we added the HDFS support in three hours. 
then uh, this step also completed with uh, on, on Google Cloud by saving the results to Google Storage. And as I mentioned, these steps have the additional overhead of copying the data to and from the farm, which added six hours and four hours respectively for the results to be copied to and from. And now on the, um, on the fourth column, I, I put the results from when we started using Secure Luster. You can see that this step completed, even with a small cluster of only 20 workers um, and only 100 gigabytes of volume for the cluster. Now, because we can read and write directly to the farm, we don't need to bring up a huge amount of volume to attach to our clusters. So with a tiny 100 gigs of volume, and a 20 medium worker, I was able to complete this step in six hours. If I increase the, um, uh, the memory of my cluster by adding 50 workers, I was able to complete these steps in three hours and 20 minutes. And if I have a comparable to the Google Cloud volume uh, cluster, 100 medium workers, this was completed in one hour and 50 minutes. 50 minutes and with no additional overhead of copying the data. Now the third row on this table has the results of the second project I, I described, which was to save the matrix table to memory and export it as a VCF. Um, as I mentioned, even with the HDFS, this step was failing to, to save the matrix table to, uh, to the disk. This step completed though, even with a 20 worker, um, uh, cluster with secure luster support. This uh, it completed a three hours to write the matrix table and an additional four hours to export the BCF file for the uh, whole exon sequencing. With 50 workers, this was done in two hours to export the matrix table and just three hours to export the BCF. I didn't run it with a hundred worker because the, the aim here was, was for me to get the results out and um, um, I wanted to release the, um, the resources for other people to use. Um, so you can see that with Secure Luster, we were able to have consistency and re reliability in the, in, the, um, in the help projects that we run. And so to conclude with this, uh, with this uh, test that we've done, Secure Luster with Hale is a perfect match for genomic research. With the Secure Luster support, we eliminate the memory constraints we had before, especially in the very memory intensive step of writing out the matrix table from Hale. We have a reliable data storage for reading and writing data sets. There, the reading and writing files from Hale is faster and uh, it, it completes even with the modest memory uh, cluster. Uh, this means that we can, we can perform various analyses uh, with OpenStack with the minimal uh, memory required, which means more OpenStack resources are available to other users. Uh, we no longer are required to have a very large volume attached to the cluster to save all the results, and we can, because we can write directly to the farm now, and the results are there, ready to be shared with the team without copying to and from the farm. Uh, the Secure Luster allows access to a fast POSIX file system from within OpenStack with no additional capital expenditure. The data is not isolated to the volume anymore, and we no, no need to transfer back to the farm or, or use S3 as an intermediary. Um, for all this work, we would like to acknowledge the help from, uh, all this, from, this, uh, from our colleagues at the Wellcome Sanger Institute from the Data Direct Networks, from Arista Networking, from Stack HPC, and Image Critic to uh, Simon Riley, Matthew Davis, and Alex Getney. Thank you for listening. And yeah, we are available for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paulus and James, for this great presentation. Uh, apparently, we are 20 minutes behind the schedule, and uh, we may not have time to take any questions. Uh, fortunately, uh, this is the last uh, presentation in the first session today, so uh, we have a uh, break um, following this.
So for anyone who has questions, uh, please feel free to stay in the chat room to ask questions. And uh, it would be highly appreciated if uh, James and uh, Pavlos can stay in the chat room for um, a little bit more time uh, to address um, any questions that many people may have. That would be highly appreciated. 